Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today I think it will be very interesting because we're looking at five days worth of updates due to my hiatus. I was extremely busy but now I'm back and I'm able to upload once again. Today we're going to be looking at important advances in the southern Donetsk, Krakove, Pokrovsk and even further northwards around Luhansk and Kharkiv. All those fronts there are important changes. We're going to be looking at the details. I've spent the past couple of hours really catching up on almost a week's worth of events. So I do apologize if it's not as granular as some other videos, but there is so much to cover that I can get caught up in too much minutia. And of course, the elephant in the room is in relation to the 2024 elections. And I did make some YouTube shorts about the election, uh, basically forecasting some of it. And I was moderately correct. I didn't get every single state projected correctly but i was able to predict the outcome of the election in the sense that trump won and you know the gop most likely having a trifecta now in terms of the way that's going to affect ukraine i'm going to spend a lot of time talking about that as uh the biden lame duck term continues and we get actually the trump inauguration so i won't focus too much on it in today's video but definitely keep in mind as we go forward that fact especially as we look at the russian advances that are occurring in the period between now until january 20th let's look at what's been going on over the past five days specifically you could see in yellow these are advances that occurred during that time frame and you could see how the russian forces have expanded past their previous chain of villages collected that are on the front line. So Shakhtarsky, Azov, Poliana, Maximivka, Bokhoy, Evlenka. Now they're expanding past those points because they have the ability to do so, especially on ridges, but uh, more so along any sort of open path or field. Uh, westwards, there is opportunity for the Russians that they're currently preparing for to expand operations to flank Velika Novosilka. This is something that is uh, being kept in mind. It's not a number one priority, but it's definitely something that's uh, it is very clearly visible on the map and with the elevation dynamics. You can see with the way that the paved roads lead into Velika Novosilka. You can see with the way that there's actually a ridge running near Rosdolne, which then extends northeastwards of Velika Novosilka. Really, really good as it provides an amazing pummeling point for the entire Mokriali River, River Valley. So that is something important to keep an eye out for in the coming weeks. But the Russian forces here have been able to advance three square kilometers westwards along with this gain northwest of Yazapoliana of about 5.4 square kilometers. We also have this geolocation here from the Shadow Drone Group, which has continued to operate in this region. Just of grenade uh, drops using drones, of course, onto Russian soldiers that were expanding control west of the village of Shakhtarska. Now remember, all these villages are now going to become forward operating posts for Russian forces. And as time goes on, as we've talked about extensively, the Russians are becoming more and more comfortable with sending in larger concentrations of either vehicles or men into these frontline positions, whether it be a tree line or into villages, and then from there branching out. And so that gives them, of course, more flexibility with the really scale of attacks and the amount of vectors that they can attack through at the same time. Uh, so here, Maximivka, this is very important. It gives the Russians a very good arrow to attack directly northwards. Uh, along this vertical direction, the Russians are only about 4.4 kilometers away from Sukhiyali. That's very important as this village connects between the current line of contact from Uspanivka, then all the way downstream to Elinka, and the current clash is going on over there, and to the wider Ukrainian rear, including Andrivka and all of its suburbs. So now there is that opportunity for the Russians to create even more uh, sort of lack of coherency between the front and the rear by putting pressure along this Maximivka route. And the Ukrainians here, they do lack the defensive density. There aren't static defensive positions here. And a lot of the units that are holding on, they're doing so. Uh, and they're able to drag out their feet in areas that are further to the southeast, like in Elinka and Yeli Zavitivka. So that's something to keep an eye out for. The Russian forces are uh, and have spent the past week really gaining very strong, solid control of all the trenches and all the tree lines in the hinterlands between the various villages that they, did get, that they did get control over and that's taken some of their time the ukrainians in small squads try resisting in some of these strong points because they actually do have some that are not shown on satellite imagery because they're hidden within the trees and there are sometimes dugouts that have some sort of camouflage on top of them or some sort of wood covering and those have to of course be overrun there's some incidents of that that i'm going to show in this video 
Uh, here you can see a polygon indicating a Russian advance of nearly 11 square kilometers. And then north of Maximivka, it's 9.9 .9 square kilometers. So you're looking at really large advances, 20 square kilometers in total in this area. Uh, here is a video from the 57th Motor Rifle Brigade, Russian units that's been heavily involved with the pushes in the Bohoyovlenka region and uh, even further northwards towards Trudovis. So that uh, one vehicle dismount infantry in a forest belt, then a bit to the east during the same round of engagements just one day later on November 6th, they had an armored vehicle dismount another assault squad uh, in one of these Ukrainian strongholds. The troops get out and they begin engaging with the Ukrainian soldiers. The Ukrainians, they move in from Wysvanivka. They send in an armored vehicle to try to conduct a localized counterattack to push back the Russians from uh, you know, getting control of such a forward outpost. But the vehicle is really forced into turning around and retreating due to a Russian FPV that eventually hits it. And the Russian side claims that the Ukrainians had to abandon the vehicle afterwards. And you could see in the video how the troops are able to get out and take over the dugouts, which indicates that a lot of these hinterlands where uh, the Ukrainians don't really have a long term plan for holding on. It's just more so a means by which for uh, the wider garrison to regroup and build up in actual villages or as squads at the front line that act as vanguards and try to delay it. But that's, of course, not sustainable. And eventually you do have, have either columns or even individual vehicles doing enough to push them out. Uh, this means that Trudeau is in trouble. It means that the Russians, if we're going to measure it right now with the uh, marker, they're about 3.4 kilometers away from the Sukhiali River, the paved road connecting all the villages together, and also this village here, Kostantinopolske, and also, of course, near Uspenivka. So that's very important to keep an eye out for those movements. Then in between Bukhoyevlenko and south of Katerinivka, Russian forces solidifying control of nearly 13 square kilometers. So that is a large scale advance per this geolocation from the 39th Motor Rifle Brigade that a column advancing towards Veseli High on November 6th. And that's important because it means the Russians are sifting directly through a lot of these Ukrainian buffer zones that they tried to formulate, tried to retain control over to buy space for a lot of these villages that are adjacent to the river. Because imagine that not only do they have to have their uh, backs basically facing the river here, which creates a lot of bottlenecks for logistics and just freedom of movement, but then also they have to deal with head on Russian assaults coming in from the south. And so really complicates the defensive prospects for all of the Ukrainians in these five specific villages that I'm going to mark with this red rectangle. All of them are now in a very complicated situation, not just due to the 39th Brigade pushing from the south and also taking over some really high elevated area. These regions are really, really good vantage points to overlook river valleys. But then also you have the push coming from Antonivka and Yelizavetivka because you have the 430th. And what is it? 1,472nd Motor F regiments. They're both involved in this region. And I have their markers on the map over here. They are involved in the push towards the, the warehouses here in this village. Although I haven't seen proof yet of the Russians capturing or even entering in a substantial amount into said settlement. But in Antonivka, they've essentially taken it over. Uh, there's some footage of that from the initial entrance from the east that occurred, I believe, on the 3rd or 4th of November. Uh, I think they took a couple of prisoners of war during that engagement and killed a few other Ukrainians from the 79th Air Assault Brigade on camera. Uh, and then you have here this footage coming out on November 6th of a lead tank and four BMPs from the 33rd Motor Rifle Regiment. I think it's from the 20th Motor Rifle Division. Uh, they had this massive artillery preparation and then they rolled in with their column with the lead tank providing suppressive fire and this was done, of course, with the Ukrainians having their own counter artillery strike onto the village, but it was not enough. And the initial Russian barrage was enough to surprise the Ukrainians and sustain enough damage that the 79th Brigade was pushed out. And the 33rd Regiment was able to gain large control over the settlement, which directly feeds into Elinka on this river bank just north of the Suhi Yali. That's a look at the Kurokova front as we can refer to it. Russian forces, if you're adding up their movements north and south of the Vavcha River, really is a massive amount, 21.4 square kilometers in total. This is in large part due to the Ukrainians being forced to withdraw from areas that were just so tumultuous 
it would have made no sense for him to retain control and get enveloped. But in some areas, the Ukrainians actually attempted to resist for a couple of days and simply did not have the means to do so. It's not out of a lack of will. It was just that they, uh, really the clashes started to occur. And the Russian side with their units, especially the 114th Motor Rifle Brigade uh, of the 51st Army Corps or um, 1st Army Corps as it used to be called from the DPR, they really were able to overrun Ukrainian positions with relative ease, uh, doing so with large amount of artillery support, aircraft support as well, uh, large air barrages in these regions. But when you look at the uh, totality of these settlements, you'll see that actually a lot of the houses here have not suffered significant damage because they were not really in the range of shelling. They weren't relevant for the massive engagements that occurred over the past half year. And at that actually reached the front line. The Russians have been able to take him over at such a pace where they didn't even have time to sustain significant damage. And that's uh, really evidenced with a lot of the footage coming out of Vovchenka. Because, of course, the 114th Brigade raised their flag in Vovchenka to make themselves uh, known and present over there. And then directly after that, they made it to Stepanivka. And this is an area where the Ukrainians actually did attempt to resist. There was a compilation from the 114th Brigade of various artillery or grenade strikes onto Ukrainian soldiers that were trying to organize around here and then force them to leave. And then, of course, almost immediately, the Russians moved in with their own vehicles and columns uh, without that much fear of being targeted by Ukrainian shelling. Uh, in that particular instance, dismounted forces, the forces raised their flag at this geolocation on November 6th, just one day after it was raised on November 5th in Vovchenka. Uh, of course, on a local level, it's important because it's a capture of additional settlements that feed into areas like Novo Ilinka and Bereski, uh, Terni, etc., which means that you do have this really sustained pressure coming from the east in addition to the north, which we'll look into in a second, that is closing in, caving in on this Ukrainian rectangle, almost you could refer to it, that has a large density of your retreating Ukrainian forces with a lack of sustainable defensive positions. There are some over here that are pretty notable, but they are in such a compact area with very, very weak flanks due to what's going on in Sonsivka, which we'll look at in a second as well. And it really does mean that the Russian forces uh, do have an incentive to continue pushing forward, not only to create the uh, territorial shifts that they intend to do, but also as a means of really maximizing Ukrainian casualties and general disarray in this specific region. And that's why the 110th Brigade was moved in to continue with the efforts to stabilize to the best of their ability. And they're doing that, of course, with two battalions of the Presidential Brigade. Uh, several battalions of the 59th uh, Brigade should also be operating, operating around here, although the status of uh, their activity is not that well known over the past few days. Uh, you have some territorial defense forces as well, but not the highest caliber uh, grouping of forces that could be imaginable. Looking at the elevation, though, this is important. The Russian forces now do have full control over a large amount of slag keeps, mines, landfills, whatever it may be. These massive vantage points, which completely dominate the rectangle under Ukrainian control that I was talking about. So those are great areas to get reconnaissance or to fire directly upon Ukrainian forces that are moving out in broad daylight. Then same thing southwards, looking at Krakowie. These mines that we're talking about, that a lot of them are in between Stepanivka and Vovchenka, or just north of Vovchenka, they're only about four or five kilometers away from the center of Krakowie. So now you can see uh, some large-scale bombardment beginning to come in as the Russian forces move their uh, short-range artillery pieces for the first time across the Vavcha River and begin firing in this zone towards the Ukrainian side, or at the very least, they get... Uh, detailed and uh, become very well versed in the locations of the Ukrainians and their movement within the city. Uh, so, of course, you have the advance itself, which is coming into the eastern portions of Kurakova, but also you have this massive elevation advantage due to Kurakova being located really the crux of a massive river valley. And in terms of the uh, direct advance to Kurakova, the Russian forces have advanced around 2.5 kilometers, taken over Ostrivska in its entirety, along with the first eastern suburbs of Kurakova, so definitely keep an eye for that. Uh, but looking at advances a bit to the north, you have the Russians, and this is all per either geolocations or Ukrainian side like Deep State Petrenko. Uh, those are ones that mention this, for instance, Kremlin Balka falling into Russian hands 
and the Ukrainians no longer have a solid grip over Vozdesenko. Uh This area, it's uh, been in a sort of gray zone for like two or three days right now. The Ukrainians are trying to create uh, a final uh, resistance movement in this region in western Novosibirsk, connected to Vozdesenko. And so the fighting has dragged that around here. A lot of that is due to uh, Presidential Brigade, I would presume, and also 110th Mechanized Brigade is fighting heavily in these clashes. Here is actually a video from Novoselly Divka from November 7th, and it's from the 110th Brigade with their uh, vehicle firing at Russian forces in the central part of the village, indicating that, again, the Russians do have an advantage here, an advance, I should say, of 6.4 square kilometers, but the Ukrainians do retain control and that gives them an artery through which to supply vehicles and men towards this village and continue dragging out the fighting because really that's what they're trying to do here. They're trying to create a solid perimeter and that includes establishing control at least for this uh, transient time of uh, being in houses in western Novoselidivka and then at the very least it buys time for forces southwards to build up the uh, pre-existing nodes which uh, you could see them over here and how they could potentially connect. Looking west of Selidove, the Ukrainians have been unable to stabilize the front line. And the consequence of this is that the Russian forces have been able to cross over the rather large portion of open fields. Those could have been fields that the Ukrainians took advantage of to the extent that they could use them as uh, these sort of open spaces to target Russian columns and soldiers. Uh, enough to really stabilize the line and just buy enough time for the Ukrainians themselves to move into reinforcements and equipment to the line of contact to key villages and then really assert themselves in a way that would make them uh, very, very, very difficult to dislodge from. But that's not actually happening. The Russian forces have been able to continue with their momentum. Let's say that it's at most uh, five or six kilometers westwards and uh, the Ukrainians really have been continually on the back foot and have not exhibited an opportunity to conduct localized counterattacks in this region. That is despite the fact that you have the activity of the 59th Brigade's tank battalion, so that's a direct response to the Russians uh, really using large amounts of armored columns uh, that are able to sift through massive amounts of fields, even if some of them take hits, the just saturation in itself allows Russian squads to dismount and then spread out and get control over additional fields. So then you have the counterbalance from the 59th Brigade's tank battalion. You have the 35th Infantry or uh, Marine Brigade, sorry, and they were moved in recently from Kherson. That's not been enough either. Looking at the map, you can see a Russian advance westwards amounting to 13.7 square kilometers. Uh, really large advances when you're looking at the course of five days. Uh, here, just to begin with Novodmitrivka, Russian forces were able to advance 0.8 square kilometers, take over essentially the entirety of said village. 35th Brigade had a tank actually fire into the western houses here. That's indicative of the Russian presence. And it also means that the Russians are on track to continue advancing along this paved road, this paved road that then branches out to Zoria. The Zoria, uh, it's an important village in the sense that it's located uh, near some of the suburbs, sort of, sort of like the beginning of the northern suburbs of Andrivka. You also have this sort of southwards advance towards Onsivka, and the Russians have a very clear route to arrive at that region, and the Ukrainians have not sufficiently prepared for the potential of the Russians taking over such a key logistics point, because it does serve as the conduit between the current uh, Ukrainian front line and this near salient, and then the actual connection to Andrivka. And so something definitely need to keep an eye out for because the Russians taking control over here would give them an amazing opportunity to expand westwards with paved roads by their side and uh, then begin putting pressure onto the northern horizontal defenses that are supposed to protect the perimeter of Andrivka and the various suburbs. Also, it would give the Russians an opportunity to cross over a lot of the tributaries that serve as natural obstacles that branch out from the Vavch River uh, and you could see that actually over here with how they sort of branch out. In any case, looking a bit northwards, Russian forces have been able to assert themselves in Novo Oleksivka, taking over uh, full control, I would say, of the settlements. It began on the 4th of November with the 80th Tank Regiment entering into Novo Oleksivka. Uh, then on November 7th, the Russians raised a flag in the Memorial Plaque area 
Then to the northwest on November 7th, you had the Ukrainians drop a grenade onto three Russian soldiers that were standing near a burning house. This indicates the Russian presence in this area, which encompasses the entirety of the village. And also it feeds directly into Eurifka, so that's a very... Uh, unpleasant situation for the Ukrainian defenders that may have been trying to build up in that region. And more generally, it expands into Pushtinka and Petrivka. So you have this entire like organization or node of villages that run along two specific uh, river valleys and one of them runs along a rail line uh, now due to their close proximity and very paved and uh, really clear routes through which to access one another. Uh, and generally, the Ukraine's inability to prevent sur- sort of direct Russian attacks like that, it means the Russians could take over those villages in a rather quick succession. So you're seeing some of that with Hurifka, where um, Hurifka, based on the footage, indicates a Russian advance. We're going to measure it of 2.2 kilometers. And you can see here the geolocations. One is not relevant to today's video. It's from October 31st. And the other one it's of three Russian armored vehicles dismounting infantry near a rear line, uh, red line in Petrivka. The troops get off. They begin to clear out the Ukrainian positions that are running along the windbreaks of the red line. The vehicles get out before they can be targeted uh, and stay intact. And this was just part of a, a broader Russian operation to dismount near the Solana River, take over Petrivka. So far, we haven't seen an, any indication of that yet. But you do have this Russian push, which I believe is extremely concerning. It's something that the Ukrainians uh, should be pouring in an extensive amount of effort into repelling. Uh, you know that the Ukrainians have been able to stabilize the situation relatively uh, east of Pokrovsk. And so now I believe some of those units, uh, due to the lack of available uh, you know, massive amounts of reserve brigades, you do have to move them around from different parts of the front line. And uh, one area would be from directly east of Pokrovsk to deal with the situation here because the consequence of all these villages falling like dominoes, which is the course in which it's going right now, would give the Russians this just massive large swath of territory in this red square, which leads directly to the road that connects between Andrivka and Pokrovsk. Also, that road crossing over means that you're really, really close. You're really inching towards the border between Donetsk and Dnipro. It's very important. And, of course, it also gives the Russians this massive attacking point, this base to begin the pressure all along the uh, second to last line of defenses defending the Pokrovsk perimeter. Because you do have all these villages running along the string, which would be directly overlooked by a Russian control in the specific region marked with X. And uh, even after that point, even after all these trenches, then you have the outer ring of the city itself, which has to be overcome. So the Russian forces will be able to uh, open up a new vector directly from the south in an area that hasn't been as well defended, where the focus hasn't been on as much, at the very least, averting Ukrainian attention away from the uh, current axis of attack. So some, something that definitely has to be kept in mind as the Russians continue to develop their attacks in that region. Now, to look at the Seversk frontier, you have two videos indicating a large-scale Russian advance north of Ivano-Darivka. This is amounting to 3.4 square kilometers for the Russian side. Based on two videos, here's the first one. You can see November 5th. It's from the 10th Mountain Assault Brigade and 54th Brigade. So they attacked nine Russian vehicles. This was done in large parts by mines, FPVs, artillery, and the like, leading to the vast majority of the vehicles in the column being damaged or destroyed entirely. But regardless, the troops that got out and ran away, they had to run into nearby tree lines. And by that point, there's a certain level of concealment and safety. And it also means that the Russian forces are able to assert themselves, uh, make a, their presence known in some of these tree lines, and then begin to be used as uh, forward attack vectors. In this case, I believe it could lead to Vrochno Kamianske. Looking westwards, there was also the goal of undermining the very, very well-built Ukrainian line of defense running along the eastern perimeter of the city of Siversk. That's an area that has to be paid close attention to, but definitely the Russians are beginning to focus on clearing out pockets of resistance east of Siversk. Uh, there's so many such pockets that are still in existence. You have this sort of like Ukrainian partial presence in Vrchnokamyanske and then south of it, you have to the north this really large bulge in Bielohorovka. So just very, very interesting to see how uh, that will end up unfolding.
Now to look at the Jarabets River front, apparently there are reports, and I'll look into more detail about this, of Ukrainian efforts to counterattack just to the north, or you could say south of Novosadove. Uh, north would be just north of Terani, because this is where the demarcation line currently stands in between those two villages, and the Ukrainians see that as an opportunity to just conduct localized counterattacks, push the Russians back slightly in this area, and then buy time for the Ukrainians to prepare the defenses for the area west of the Jerebes River. Additionally, you had a Russian advance here about into 1.8 square kilometers. This occurred just to the east of Yampolivka. Here's the geolocation from November 4th. It's from the 51st Battalion of the 63rd Mechanized Brigade. So they repelled a Russian column that was heading east of Yampolivka. And in this case, the Russian forces were able to improve their local positions which means there's going to be more sustained pressure, uh, 1.6 kilometers, more sustained pressure towards these three villages. And I suppose you could also say Zarykhnia and Torska to the south. So, uh, you know, four villages in total located east of the river that serve as key nodes for the Ukrainian side. And then, of course, you have the various crossings that are largely intact and have not been destroyed as of now. But the Russian side really is positioned in a way that squeezes the Ukrainians into a corner. And besides that fact, you do have this very strong pummeling of the Ukrainian villages in this area by Fab 500s, continually on the same ruins, on the same positions where Ukrainians return to. Uh, there are strikes organized in those directions. Of course, there's also these three really dense forested areas leading directly into settlements. And so those areas will now become accessible for Russian soldiers as they continue to gain ground in these large open fields and have not really been interested in engaging in the fierce clashes house to house. The area where that most notably happened would be in Nevske and also, of course, in Navosodove. Now, looking at the Oskia Riverfront situation here uh, has deteriorated once again due to the confirmation of reports that I talked about actually a week and a half ago or two weeks ago. Surrounding the Russian entrance into Persia Travnive, the fact that the Russian forces did have the wherewithal to break through the Ukrainian line, take over Vishnev, and not just that, but actually go into the next settlement within a matter of days, uh, really does indicate that there was a lack of uh, Ukrainian pushback. They were simply unable to, based on the uh, forced rationing of resources and the lack of manpower to go ahead and conduct a localized counterattack, like we actually did see unfold with the Tyranny region. Uh, but here you can see a video, not this one, but there's uh, this specific video is of the 3rd Tank Brigade, so that's a Ukrainian unit, unit that is operating generally in the sector, also a bit to the north near the city of Kupiansk. And so their FPV element, they destroyed a Russian tank in Persia Travneve. So that is a in really strong indication of the Russian presence in this area. And it also indicates that there has been a capture of 7.86 square kilometers. So again, large amount of quantity and the most outstanding sort of concern would be with the Ukrainian positions located in the salient. Uh, it is compromised, just large open fields, and you already have attempts by the 44th Mechanized Brigade, or 43rd, sorry, to uh, really hold the line as much as possible and just provide some sort of uh, final pushback against the Russian advances there over here. So just to summarize, on a local level, Persia Travneve and the surrounding fields do serve as these uh, good vantage points for the rest of the local battlefield. There's a few electric towers as well in the area. Also, it provides the Russians with the resources to directly enter into and fire upon the trenches that are, uh, you know, this final layer between the fighting right now and the Oskil River because you have this chain of fortifications from Novo Platonov, uh, Platonivka all the way to, uh, what is this, Shikivka or whatever. And then to the west, you have this one other just line of uh, perimeter defenses to protect uh, Borova because it's one of the most important Ukrainian cities still under their control that is east of said river. And to conclude, we're going to look at the uh, area south of Kupiansk. Again, really important here. The first guards tank army put in a significant amount of effort into advancing both south of Kruhlia and north of Kolosnikivka. So just to begin with Kruhlia Kivka, you have this video here of the Pomstar Revenge Brigade. They uh, destroyed two Russian trucks and one armored personnel carrier 
with their uh, grenade drops mainly and that is just a reflection of the unit composition in this area and includes as we talked about before the third tank brigade a bit from the south fourth tank brigade is also generally present around here a bit to the north you have this russian advance into close to Kivka itself actually including 3.9 square kilometer capture and so in this video which shows the furthest extent of the russian side it's from the uh krila omega group so that previously had an operation along the sumi border not in kursk but around the kursk sumi border for a very long time and now november 6 they released a video of a strike fpv strike onto a dugout and this occurred in an area that is in the more forested portion of the northern coast of Kivka. So this area is just dense with large portions of forested, uh, you know, presence leading directly into Hushkivka. And then from there into uh, Novo Sninove and just the southern suburbs of Kupiansk. So uh, really is a great opportunity to continue pushing along a very specific axis. And when the Russian forces do press along an axis and then are able to uh, push off any sort of realistic alternatives due to these Russian advances really being so concentrated in this case running along a paved road just east of the Alskia River and then connecting from one village to another and then leaves all these other Ukrainian soldiers that are uh, again we're talking about in the dozens now in each individual case but they are still worth noting as troops with a lot of frontline experience and uh, actual infantrymen that are fighting at the front lines a lot of them being uh, enveloped in uh, almost near encirclements and a lot of times it's actually just pressure from three axes which is still very significant because you did have a lot of activity of the Russian side just north of Samakivka and to the west of Kuzimivka and what this means is that there's a very precarious position for whatever you, uh, Ukraine, yeah, Ukrainians are remaining in these large swaths of open fields that have already sustained pressure from the east some from the north and also some from the west it could of course become worse for whatever garrison remains over here and uh, that's why it's advisory by now for those ukrainian soldiers to uh withdraw coherently to the next set of defensive networks in this area which would include these two over here these three over here uh basically running along the entire uh, tributary branching out of uh, lozova and so yeah that's all that for today i would have Hope to get into a lot of detail about these specific advances, but I believe I'll be able to do that over the next couple of weeks, and you guys really will enjoy it. I'm also going to enjoy it, of course, uh, discussing the situation with you guys, so I really do appreciate it, and goodbye, everybody. Thank you.